Georgia has made a couple coaching changes, and we invite Palmer Toms back on the show to talk about that today on today's episode of the Crowd of Booth. How in here and make yourself feel at home. The Crowded Booth is coming on. The Crowded Booth with Bryce Coon. All right. Well, we, we bring Palmer Toms into the show and we got Ralph Leary in the background. We welcome everybody. And, and thanks for tuning in as Georgia has made two key hires. One Palmer that has affected a large portion of the crowded booth fan base very dearly. Um, and then another one that the guy who was let go, not let go, I apologize, left and moved on is also somehow still affecting that portion of the fan base as well. But Palmer, appreciate you doing your best Jake Rowe impersonation with the Masters hat. Are you ready for golf? Do you have an early favorite for the Masters? I know that makes no sense, but who do you who do you like? Uh, I'm, I'm ready for golf. I'm ready for the warm weather to stick. And, and I'm excited that I'm on the show talking Georgia, not Georgia Tech. And and it's that this was a planned appearance um, as opposed to a, hey, Palmer, you want to come on the show? Yeah, sure. Are we live? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me make myself presentable. So um, I, I might have just thrown on a master's hat then, too. You might have. I, I think you might have. Ralph just said the comments background because if you say Rory, he's going to be pissed. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it is what it is. But we will be talking some masters as we get uh, closer, closer to that weekend. Palmer, the big news coming out of Athens. No, uh, it's not anything to do with spring football just quite yet. It is still some coaching changes, which first off, man, I've kind of been lucky down here. Like LSU said, we're getting the coaching changes out of the way early January. But still, you're seeing so many moves kind of that last tenth on the field staffer at many places has not been filled yet. Now, Georgia moved quickly. Um, obviously, the news, Del McGee takes the head coaching job at Georgia State. We're going to get into that. Um, and then Brian McClendon moving on to the NFL, but also was a heavy candidate in that Georgia State head coaching job. As we start off here, before we talk about who replaced, Brian McClendon was obviously a really nice piece and you know everything, but, but Del McGee speaks volumes in this state. We've talked about it in our show. Uh, my two co-hosts there, Will and Ralph, got a little hot water over the weekend talking about Del McGee's potential impact in Atlanta. Man, look, we're based out of Columbus. We know what Del McGee can do. We, we've seen, you know, what he can, how he can, uh, you know, just completely revitalize a program and bring them to the top of the high school ranks. I did a fantastic job. Maybe should have gotten the job as the interim head coach at uh, Georgia Southern. Your thoughts on the impact of Del McGee's departure and. What's the mood of Georgia fans? Because I was perusing some message boards. Like, you know, we're happy for him. Like, it's a guy that kind of really, he deserves this shot. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely when you've been around as long as Del McGee has, um, it, it's it's a, you know, attitude of, of excitement for him. Um, you know, I, I wonder, it's, you know, for all the talk of over the years of, oh, well, he's going to go back to his alma mater and be their running backs coach and all that. I, that wouldn't have been met with the same excitement as him moving into, um, you know, a different position at a school like Georgia State in a city like Atlanta, and, and also, you know, moving into a head coaching job. I mean, it, it's not like he's making a jump from Georgia running backs coach to Georgia State offensive coordinator. Um, you know, he adds to the Kirby Smart coaching tree here, and um, you know, one of two, the two last two uh, OG members of Kirby's staff. Um, him and Glenn Schumann were a part of the group that Kirby brought in in 2016. And you look at the back at that group now and, and you're looking at, I want to say it's five head coaches. Um, maybe that, maybe that number's off, but you had Mel Tucker, you had Shane Beamer, you had Sam Pittman, you had Del McGee. Um, I, Dan Lanning was not a part of that group, but he went on to be a head coach. Fran Brown was not a part of that group, but he went on to be a head coach. So there's, um, unless I'm completely forgetting somebody, uh, he's got six head coaches. Um, you look at the guys that were on that staff that went on to be coordinators elsewhere. There were a couple of those. And, um, you know, even, even a couple that went on to be coordinators at Georgia and, and then returned, you know, obviously Glenn Schumann being a coordinator at Georgia, uh, you know, now, and, and James Coley was a coordinator at Georgia and is now returning as a receivers coach. Um, we'll get into that, I'm sure. But, you know, obviously uh, with the time that Dell served in Athens, th there's a lot of appreciation for him. And and I, I think that, you know, as we talk about Georgia State and 
the potential that he has there. Um, you know, it, it'll be, I, I, I heard what Ralph and Will had to say, and I don't know that I'd go that far. Um, I don't know that I'd go as far as to say that, that Georgia state is going to be the premier program in Atlanta. Um, but I definitely think that there's, there's something to be said for somebody that has in-state ties and, you know, knows high school coaches around this area, um, you know, has been a part of a, you know, building a successful program at Georgia. And, and look, the infrastructure is not there at, at Georgia State like it is in Athens. But, you know, th- there's a lot of talent that, that goes unnoticed in, in this state. And, you know, I, I watched his intro press conference and he said, look, we got to find the diamonds in the rough. And, you know, joked with Kirby that said, hey, you know, I, I know you're going to be coming to get, take some of my players because I'm going to bring in some good ones. So um, you, you got to like his confidence for sure. Um, and, and I think that, you know, ultimately it's a really great fit for him. You're muted. <laughs> I, like, I like how Ralph didn't have to tell me that. See, <laughs> he's already pissed. All right, we'll stop it. Ralph, mark that at 610. Uh, he I, obviously, you know, Palmer, McGee's already made the move to hire Kevin Scher uh, as his defensive coordinator and made the move to hire um, Jim Chaney as his offensive coordinator, two guys with, interesting enough, UGA and Georgia Tech ties. Uh, but when you kind you of guys look, were part of that OG staff as well. Yes, yes. And so, I, not getting too much into the Georgia State side of things with Del McGee, I, I, I differed from Will in the sense of he's going to win some recruiting battles against some premier programs, I feel like, just because of how relational he is. And two, to your point of what he said, those diamonds in the rough. You know, look, Georgia has done, I, I think, the mark of what is an elite program. It's not just that you just get the high-profile players. If you win, those guys want to come play for you. But it's the three stars that you identify as saying, hey, I mean, look, you're in this business. I'm in this business. We know the propensity to just slap a three-star rating on a kid and move them along in the cycle. That, look, to identify which three stars are going to be beneficial can be stars, I think that's the difference where Del McGee is going to be able to make. And how does that affect Georgia with the guys they currently have on staff, uh, you know, losing an ace recruiter, um, like I think you're, you, know, you guys, as Jeremy Johnson mentioned him and many other guys have said, this guy's an ace recruiter. He was a big part of relationships with a lot of different players, even outside the running back room at Georgia. I mean, you know, look no further than Michael Williams. I mean, somebody that, you know, we when we go back and, and we listened to, um, you know, prior to Michael's first year, we got to talk to Dell and we talked about the relationship that he had with Michael and, and, you know, how exciting that was for him to land a Columbus kid like that, you know, a, a incredibly talented one. And he said, look, this, that was years in the making. He said, you know, I, I've been talking to his, his family about him coming to play here for a long time. Um, you know, and, and that's not, you know, just Del McGee, the coach that's Del McGee, the person, um, you know, and he's been involved in a lot of those type of recruitments. Um, you know, you, you look around this team and yes, Georgia has expanded its reach over the last, you know, several years of, of you know, becoming this na- nationwide national brand. Um, you know, Georgia has done that. But the core of this program, as long as Kirby Smart's here, will always be recruiting the state of Georgia. You don't yeah. want those talented players to get out. And, and I mean, you know, look at the way that he treated that KJ Bolden recruitment. He, you know, KJ even said that Kirby told him, Hey, I'm not letting you get out of this state. I'm not letting you get away because he did. He let Caleb Downs get away. That was one that I think will haunt Kirby um, for, for a little while. And, and, you know, to, to be able to take, um, you know, the lessons of that um, and, and move along and, and value that in-state recruiting. That's something that Kirby will do continue to do. It's something that he has clearly prioritized in the hires that he's made, but also I think it's, it's the recipe that Del McGee is going to take. And, and, you know, again, like I said, he mentioned that the state of Georgia is so rich with talent that a lot of the big programs come here and they, they take their pick of players but there's a lot of really good players in this state outside of those. And so, um, you know, I, I think that somebody, again, somebody that has those ties to the high school level mm-hmm. understands that 
uh, about the fact that there are so many talented players and he knows where to go get them. He knows what yeah. programs are really good, just produce good football players. Um, you know, and, and he knows where to go find those guys, um, you know, that, that maybe, maybe a, a big program, a bigger program, a, a power four program is going after um, a, a guy, but, you know, at the same time, um, you know, if, I mean, I'm, I think I'd take Del McGee in a recruiting battle uh, against Vanderbilt and, you know, yeah, yeah. There, there's, you know, the Vanderbilt and the Commodores get to wear, uh, that SEC patch on their jersey, but Del McGee's got relationships in this state. Now, am I thinking that he's going to go beat Georgia and anybody that's wearing the you know Georgia G? No, I don't think he's doing yeah. that for kids. Um, you know, he 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 might have kids that uh, you know are, are choosing to go be on scholarship at Georgia State as opposed to walking on at Georgia. Now, that's absolutely on the table. But do I think mm -hmm. that he's going to go? beat out Kirby for a KJ Bolden. No, I don't think that's happening. And I don't think anybody expects that to happen, but I yeah. do expect Del McGee to make Georgia state a program, uh, you know, with in the state of Georgia specifically, I don't know what kind of national reach they'll have, but I think that in the peach state, Georgia state will be a premier recruiting program. Mm, that's good stuff right there. I said, I wasn't going to ask you this, but I'm going to now. <laughs> I, he's going to, I, I have a really strong feeling he's going to beat out Brent key for some folks within Atlanta. How, how do you it, feel? On that? It, yeah. I mean, I, I think that at some point, you know, I, look, I, I, I don't think that if you were, if you were talking about a winning percentage here and, and Del McGee versus Brent key, oh, uh, yeah. you know, I, I Brent key's still going to be above 500 there. But mm -hmm. Del McGee's not not going winless. He's he's yeah. getting you know one out of every ten, two out of every ten recruitments where those two are going head to head. And um, you know, I, I think that I, I don't think that 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 is going to hurt Georgia Tech uh, as much as I think it's going to just elevate Georgia State. Georgia Tech is is who they are, you know, as as an academic program. They're able to bring in. They've got a national reach in a different way, but in the in a you know similar reach where they're able to go outside of the state of Georgia because there's something appealing about it. Um, you're able to go get a you know a, a Jalen King out of Tennessee. You know, somebody that yeah. you know I, I I knew in high school and um, you know smart kid and and he wanted to prioritize academics. You know, good for him. And, yeah. and, you know, to go do that at a, at a place like Georgia Tech, those are the kids that he, they're going to continue to get. That's why I don't think that this will hurt Georgia Tech. But mm -hmm. you may not see, um, you know, you, you may not see one of those three stars uh, that, that maybe turns into something at Tech. You may see them turning into something at Georgia State. Yeah, I can think of a certain three-star receiver that probably would have made his way to Georgia State over Georgia Tech. Uh, and we'll talk about a big reason why he's at Georgia Tech as we move along. James Coley and Josh Crawford added to Georgia's staff. Palmer, this, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously with with me you know, being around Georgia Tech and everything, I know the name Josh Crawford. Tech fans know who that is. I can tell you Georgia's getting a guy that understands this state, which fits the mold of like what you said earlier about what Kirby Smart wants. Crawford understands that he's coached at multiple different high level programs inside this state. Now, you know, some of the best the state has to offer in terms of high school football programs. He's also made his name and kind of had a rapid rise. I mean, you look back three, four years ago where this guy was now he's in a position where, I mean, I'm like, I, like you, you put together two, three really good years, some elite recruiting classes. Look at what Fran Brown just did. Like yep. that, that's, that's the type of trajectory. So talk to me, let's talk about, Obviously, both of these guys, James Coley, you know, for, to the casual fan was probably like, wait, didn't Georgia fans hate that guy? Like type of thing. So talk about both of these additions, what they bring to the table. Yeah. I mean, if, if you get on our message board, um, you know, there, it's been very mixed reviews with James Coley's return um, and and understandably so. I mean, you know, I, I, I've, I was critical of him in 2019. Um, you know, there was reason to be critical of him in 2019. Um, but if you look at his work outside of a coordinator role, outside of a play calling role, there's a lot that, that you got to tip your cap to. And, and I think that that, you know, notice Josh Crawford's getting run game coordinator. James Coley's not getting passing game coordinator. He's not getting a, a coordinator title to it. And, you know, I, I think that we, as long as Mike Bobo is calling plays in Athens, 
Um, you know, James Coley's going to be involved. James Coley's going to have a say because he's part of that offensive coaching staff. Um, but James Coley's not going to be asked to be a coordinator. He's not going to be asked to be, um, you know, a, a true decision maker in terms of Georgia's scheme. Georgia has a yeah. scheme. We we saw that the carryover, you know, from from Todd Munkin to Mike Bobo. Now they've got their scheme, you know, and, and that's the, they're going to want to keep that going. Um, they don't want to go back to 2019. <laughs> I mean, they 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 went away from James Coley in, in you know 2019 to get to Todd Munkin in 2020, uh, and they decided that they liked what they saw in Todd Munkin and that system, and they wanted to stay with that, and so. They they hired internally and they brought in Mike Bobo. Um, so you know I, I I think that the Coley hire you know like you said um, you know a lot of people um, you know see that name and and think that 2019 season. But I think that you've also got to realize the the kind of recruiter that he is. Um, and, and in a similar way with Dell, where it's not just at his position. Um, you know James Coley was a huge factor in bringing in a lot of really good players from South Florida. Um, you know, Tyson Campbell is, is one that comes to mind. Um, you know, and, and he brought in some good, pretty solid receivers as well. Now, not everything worked out with some of those guys, um, you know, but that 2019 team probably would have been different if Jeremiah Holloman wasn't kicked off the team prior to the start of the season. Um, you know, a, a good recruiter, a, a good receiver there. George Pickens was obviously a really good receiver. Um, you know, Lawrence, he, he played a part in bringing in the transfer of Lawrence Cager, um, you know, and, and look, he, he, the Coley addition to me is a lot more about understanding what Georgia wants to do. Um, you know, he clearly understands that from the time that he spent in Athens, um, and, and, and he's an ace recruiter. I mean, uh, the, and I think that maybe we're throwing that term around a little bit too much, but, you know, in, in the case of James Coley, it is it is certainly applicable. And, you know, I think that the recruiting factor was was, uh, you know, certainly a, you know, a big decision making, uh, you know, big part of the reason that Georgia decided to bring in Josh Crawford as well. Um, like you said, that he's he played a part in getting a really talented player to Georgia Tech. And, um, you know, if, if Georgia would love to have a, a kid like that. Um, you know, but similar to Dell, and I think that the biggest reason why you're bringing in Josh Crawford, you lose Dell McGee, who had obvious ties to the state of Georgia. You also lose Brian McClendon, and, and you could argue that those were your two best Atlanta area recruiters. Bringing in James Coley doesn't necessarily address that. Now, he's got ties to the state of Georgia from his time here previously, and that'll help. But Josh Crawford is somebody that has a lot of ties to the state of Georgia given the fact that he's coached at the high school level, you know, Jefferson County, Colquitt County, Lee County, Valdosta, part of some really successful high school football programs in this state. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, and, and then, like you said, a, a you know, up and coming star in, in assistant coaching, um, you know, his trajectory from Western Kentucky, you know, part of some incredible offenses there. I, I think that maybe, you know, he, he's able to bring some ingenuity, uh, you know, creativity, to this Georgia offense, um, you know, and, and you're thinking, you know, you, you're probably thinking, Hey, he's coached wide receivers. How is he going to coach running backs? You know, you, we're talking about two guys that George is bringing in here and James Coley and Josh Crawford that are wide receivers coaches. Well, Josh Crawford played the running back position and, and, and a, with running back position, it's a lot more of a talent acquisition thing than it is a coaching thing. Um, you know, Kirby smart was not a running back had not coached running backs, coached running backs under Mark Rick. Um, Brian McClendon, not a running back, coached running backs. Um, you know, so we've seen some people coach running backs before, um, you know, and 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 I, I think that if it, Crawford's been a part of, you know, like we said, some really talented offenses, has coached that position before at the high school level, played that position at the college level, he knows what it takes to be a solid running back. And yeah. if you're able to recruit really good players at that position, it may not matter how good of a coach you are. Those guys are probably going to be pretty good players regardless of, you know, what you're telling them. Sometimes sometimes less coaching is even better. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And it feels like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Georgia starts spring practice, what, March 12th? Is that 12th. correct? 12th. 12th. So, I mean, you know, it's going to be interesting. I'm sure you guys will, you know, obviously, do you guys get to go watch spring practice? TBD. Sometimes. TBD. TBD. Who knows? So, you know, one thing I was talking about this, uh, we recorded an Auburn podcast, had an LSU podcast earlier too, was when you have new coaches, it's not necessarily you're going to see a lot of schematic things or you're going to see like some deep, you know, things. It's more of the teaching. You know, how are the players responding to the teaching? Uh, what does the relationship look like? Are there pull asides for, you know, one-on-ones, you know, with that? That kind of, you know, gives you an inside type of respect that some guys that are already in maybe entrenched into some positions, you know, in both of these respective rooms respond to a new guy and a new voice leading that room. But it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, as well, Palmer. But uh, two big additions there for Georgia, and you highlighted uh, why. Spring ball, spring ball starts March 12th for you guys, March 5th down here. How ready are you for uh, just it, – it, I don't know. It feels like we've been covering nonstop for the past month and a half, and it's like, oh, now, yeah, we get spring ball. Like, there's no – it's just – it's crazy. Yeah. It, it's – I'm definitely ready for it. Um, you know, it, it's long awaited, um, a little bit longer this time around than it has been the last couple of years. Um, because Georgia obviously wrapped up mm. before the new year and wasn't playing in one of those new year six and wasn't playing in a national championship. So that made January and February feel a little bit longer, but I think it might make spring football feel a little bit sweeter. Hmm. I like it. I like it. Palmer Tom's dogs HQ over on the on three, uh, network does a fantastic job. Check out his work. Um, I'm sure that you can just head over to his social media. He's look, he's plugging it right there. Dogs HQ doesn't matter that we work for rival companies. We can come together and have a, have, have a good time. So that's Palmer Toms. My name's Bryce Kuhn, uh, Ralph Lear in the background, talking Georgia, big additions. Tell us what you think down in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe, hit notifications. Palmer, uh, Monday night, we're talking, which we're going to, you know, obviously want people to tune in. We're going to power rank the conferences. Uh, we've done some interesting power rankings that have been over the past couple. Are you all just uh, doing the weeks. four or are you, are you getting into the group of five as well? This is a group of five stand podcast. I don't know if you realize, but Ralph, yeah, Ralph's a big SMU guy now, so uh, he's all about pony up. We we uh, we've gotten, but some hey, they're, they're they're power four now. They're power four. That's true. They're Ralph's dark horse. So there's also that too. Um, wow, fun stuff. Palmer Tom's. My name is Bryce Coon. We'll catch you next time here on the Crowd of Booth. Coming on the crowded booth with Bryce Coons.